Do you feel alone? Do you, whether you're talking with somebody, hugging them, kissing them, f***ing them, or even looking directly into their eyes, feel like you're still alone? Have you spent your life trying to push the limits of how close you can bring another person to you, only to find that no matter how intimate the two of you are, you're still just alone? After those rare moments when you truly bare your soul and say exactly what's on your mind to another person, do you feel unsatisfied? Like you should have said something differently, or like they must have completely missed the point? Maybe you've tried butting your way into pre-existing groups of friends, or even having your own groups form around you, only to end up feeling even more alone. Do these other people feel the same way about you? Are your relationships just their most recent iterations of a long, exhausted concept of true oneness with someone else? Maybe you are alone. You spend so much time thinking about how none of these people will ever know the real you. You put so much thought and effort into demonstrating to all of them who the real you is. But once the performance is done, you just go right back to dwelling on whether or not they understood your message. As far as the world is concerned, maybe there is no real you. Maybe you are just your job, your grades, your politics. Nobody understands the connections between all of those different genres of music you listen to. Nobody else sees a pickup truck as the same dazzling array of complicated symbolism and iconography that you do. You've tried explaining it to them, and they nodded their heads, but they'll never see it how you do. Maybe you don't exist at all. Not the real you, anyway. That person will never truly be a part of anyone else's lives. Your true self is just a random sequence of ideas and opinions popping in and out of a single, meaningless perspective on life. No single one significant enough to ever impact anything around you. Your true self is nothing but a sequence of random numbers, functionally identical to the 8,067,572,200 291 other sequences of random numbers which inhabit the minds of the human race. Nobody will ever care about your number sequence. Or at least, that's how it feels a lot of the time. Disco Elysium starts out a lot like this video did. Total darkness, challenged only by a fading light in a trash living space. The product of a self-destruction that was indescribably beautiful and yet tiringly cliche. Empty thoughts about how cruel and hard the world is and how badly you wanted to be a part of it before you just gave up. In that room, in that mind, in that body, you're entirely alone. Stuck inside of a lead sphere that has no escape, so vast and foggy that you can't even see the walls. Until one day, a tiny little pinprick pierces those walls, urging you to try journeying to the edge of your mind prison again. That pinprick was the sound of a motor carriage, driven by uh, Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi of the Revisol Citizens Militia, Precinct 57. In other words, he's a cop, and he's here for you. Apparently, you're a cop, too. You've been sent here to investigate a dead body hanged in a tree. Normally, in a story like this, I'd go on to talk about the specifics of the case, the key suspects, the possible motives behind the killing, the mystery that you're supposed to be solving. However, this game's story isn't really what it's about. Disco Elysium isn't about murder, or bigotry, or classism, or unionization, or communism, or fascism, or substance abuse, or lost love, or any of that stuff. This is a game about disco. The era of disco was a time of self-expression. Singing and dancing, free love, partying, drug use, sexual exploration, crazy hairstyles a never-ending celebration of the individual. It was a culture which was centered entirely around being seen, being represented, making yourself known, injecting yourself into every situation and never stopping until yourself was truly expressed. The world was yours. You weren't just in it, you were a part of it. 
It was the most beautiful thing in the world. A party that was gonna last forever. But that party didn't last forever, did it? All the best and coolest people got arrested. Others overdosed and died. A once endless sea of muscles and joints became sore and sparse. Minds became slower. Everyone traded free love for true love and then marriage. When the disco era died, it was because the hangovers eventually got too bad for anybody to bear, and so people quit writing music about the party and started writing music about the hangovers. Society left behind those like you, who weren't ready for the party to end. Nobody wanted to dance with you anymore. Nobody wanted to hear your story or your opinions. Nobody loved you, and nobody wanted to fuck you. It was all over. This is where Harry Dubois was when he discovered a different kind of drinking. The kind that you do alone. The kind of drinking that's supposed to make you forget about the fact that nobody cares about you. The kind of drinking that people do to die. It's pretty reasonable to say that Harry did die at the tail end of his binge of apocalyptic proportions. He woke up not remembering anything. He can't remember what a cop is, or a car, or money, or communism, or even disco, the thing that he dedicated his entire past life to. He was a totally blank slate. Maybe he'd turn out to be an amazing cop, or an anarchist who sabotages his own investigation. Maybe he'd be a communist, or a fascist, or even a pathetic centrist. Or maybe he'd just spend the rest of his life apologizing for who he used to be. He was a new man, with a new personality, but he had the same old problem that he had before he destroyed his brain. Disco was still dead, and nobody ever would care about him again. Nobody wanted to know the true him. So, Harry has three objectives at the start of this story. Firstly, figure out who he is, his true self. Secondly, find out how to make people care. And thirdly, solve the murder. With how truly elusive your clues are and how many people would have been motivated to kill Lely, you'd think that that would be your biggest challenge. But throughout the story, those other two objectives, abstract and unmarked as they may be, tend to take priority. So, let's see if we can handle them. How exactly does somebody discover their true self? Well, one possible solution would be to give in to a thousand intrusive thoughts and see which ones feel right. This is more or less what kids do when they're growing up. When you're young, maybe the little voice in your head called your inner monologue tells you that you should totally make a loud fart noise in the middle of a boring lecture. Maybe it tells you to go kiss someone of the same gender. Maybe it tells you to smoke a cigarette or bully another kid or to write some sort of edgy poem. <laughs> oh, one time I even called myself a Republican. I think we can all plainly see how that turned out. Other times, this internal monologue tells you to give some change to a homeless person, or to try laying off on honking your horn, or to try out some new genre of music. Sometimes we do as the intrusive thoughts say, other times we don't, and through these decisions and how we feel about their consequences, we learn about ourselves. Maybe kissing another girl felt great. Maybe you felt like a pushover when you didn't honk the horn at that asshole. Maybe that new genre of music awoke some long dormant perspective on the type of person that you could be. Through these actions and reactions, you start to learn about what type of a person you are. As I said, this is what kids do. It's called character building. Harry, well, he might as well be a kid. He's just a child unleashed on the world with access to guns and drugs and authority. The world he finds himself in, the district of Revishal, is just a perfect playing ground for him to make a long list of enemies and a short list of sympathizers, and above all else, a thesis on who he truly is. And it all takes the form of these intrusive thoughts. See, in every other role-playing game, your dialogue options are framed as possibilities. When you choose a dialogue option, you more or less lock in exactly what your character was thinking about when asked a certain question or given a certain situation. Here in Disco Elysium, though, those dialogue options are framed as intrusive thoughts. 
As the player, we have surprisingly little input on the story outside of deciding which of Harry's intrusive thoughts will win. Each of our skills actively talk to us in our own internal monologue with their own distinct voice and perspective. Your composure might start freaking out and tell you that you shouldn't trust your drama skill or your conceptualization skill because they've become compromised by the current situation. Other times, drama might tell you that somebody's lying, while rhetoric tells you that you're just being paranoid and that you should definitely pick the second option. This is exactly how people learn about themselves. You just do things, functionally at random, letting all sorts of different intrusive thoughts win or lose until you have an idea of how you should think about things. Back on my second playthrough of this game, I was talking to Gart, the hostel manager, trying to help him get over a co-worker he had feelings for by telling him, ah, you don't need her. And this quickly cascaded into me rambling on and on about some misogynistic, sexuality-shaming concept called the cock carousel that this co-worker of his was supposedly riding, and how she'd be all dried up and useless by the end of it. <laughs> Naturally, this isn't at all what I meant to say or how I feel. But after a series of bad, intrusive thoughts kept winning over and over, I wound up discovering just how easily the child-minded and ever-impressionable Harry Dubois could end up staring down the mouth of the misogynist pipeline. One time I started out a playthrough with the intent of playing Harry as a fascist, who was just bigoted in every different direction, and impossibly conservative towards all concepts. But I quickly found out that this just isn't the type of game that you can manipulate like that. It's simply hard to keep Harry's head pointed in a single direction for that long. You might start saying a bunch of communist-aligned things, for example, but eventually the game starts making fun of it. Keep saying things like, down with the bourgeoisie, eat the rich, sodomize the landowners, impel all people who have more than 25 real in their pocket, literally murder all human beings regardless of their political beliefs. That kind of stuff. Oh yes, the mask of ambivalence. Don't deny it. You're about to rip it off and reveal the monstrous seven-eyed lamb of global communism that would devour and masticate mankind. And you're left choosing if you want to just lock it in and stick with this strange, critical perception of yourself simply to have some semblance of identity. Sure, as a communist, you know damn well that communism has already failed, and you're never going to make so much as a dent in bringing it back to life. But at least if you're a communist, you've got the ability to say, I am a communist. It's finally something Harry can identify himself with. By the time this usually happens in the game, you'd be lucky for Harry to even know that his name is or was Harry yet. All you really know about yourself at this point in the game is that Kim calls you officer when he's angry with you and detective the rest of the time. Now, however, you can, at the very least, call yourself the communist detective, the fascist detective, the moralist detective, the racist detective, or even the centrist detective if you're just too boring to pick a more colorful stance. It's not much, but on most playthroughs, it's going to be the very first bit of identity that you have for yourself. Of course, with identity comes self-critique. None of these options are really going to feel good when you finally decide to commit to them. Your internal monologue is always going to mock you for your stance because humans, especially pathetic ones like Harry, are simply too insecure to completely trust their own gut in most situations. The point is that building an identity for yourself is incredibly painful and incredibly scary, especially if you're already old enough to feel humility. Even a stance as simple as, I think workers should have the right to unionize, brings about mental images of millions of dead idealists, each one's fighting a hopeless fight for a more fair world. And then, if you're a communist, you picture yourself on that pile, and come to the inevitable conclusion that your death too would be meaningless. It goes both ways too. If you're a true free market hustler, you're going to have to constantly reconcile your own success with the ruin and desperation that surrounds you. You'll need to endlessly justify it in your own head, saying things like, well, they should have worked harder like I did, all while a nagging voice in the back of your head assures you that you know it was never that simple. See, I don't actually think Disco Elysium is a super political game, and I definitely don't think it's a communist game like so many people like to say it is. Disco Elysium is a game about 
those three objectives that I mentioned earlier. Finding an identity for yourself, figuring out how to make people care about that identity, and solving a murder. It just so happens that politics are a pretty key part of anyone's identity, for better or more realistically for worse. I definitely think that Harry, in his circumstances, has a sort of predisposition towards communism, but that most definitely is not the game itself preaching communism. We'll get into how, and more importantly, why the game tends to steer Harry down the communist path later. Basically, the parallels between communism and disco, primarily millions of washed up idealists slowly giving up on a dream, are pretty fundamental to understanding this game, so believe me, I will be covering it here. In the meantime though, let's get back to that first objective, building an identity for yourself. See how this game likes to sidetrack you? <laughs> so there's a lot more to a personality than just your politics. There are a lot of different ways to discover and express that personality in this game too. Generally speaking, Disco Elysium likes to summarize it as your copotype. You could be a sorry cop, constantly apologizing for everything that your job and your alcoholism entails. Or you could be an apocalypse cop, constantly warning people about the end of the universe. Translation for when you forget everything again. That's another thing we'll get into a bit later. You could also be a superstar cop, a good cop, a bad cop, a hobo cop, hustler cop, a boring cop, an art cop, an honorable cop. There are a lot of cop types and mechanically they function a lot like the political leanings that you can choose to commit to. You simply resist or surrender to all of these different intrusive thoughts that the game presents you with. And at some point, relatively early on, your brain will pull you aside to make sure that you feel slightly stupid, slightly emboldened to continue saying and doing the type of things you have been doing. You aren't even locked into a single copper type either. You can dual spec as it were. So there. Between your politics and your copotype, you've got something like a personality for yourself. Some sense of an identity. The game even lets you choose to reject or embrace your name once you learn it. Or you can even come up with a different name for yourself. Though, whether you roll with Harry Dubois, Krasmazov, Tequila Sunset, Firewalker, Icebreaker, Dick Mullen, Captain Sober, Dinky Winky, Shit Kid, or any of the other aliases at your disposal, everyone will still just call you Harry. That brings us to objective number two. How the hell do we get anybody to really care about us? How do we get people to see the world that we see? This is a task that doesn't really get any sort of concrete resolution until the very end of the game. All along the way, we get the chance to do some wildly expressive things. We can pick out a song and sing karaoke, we can take Lillian out on a walk along the island, talking to her about our perspective on things, we can play pinball in front of Kim and punch a juvenile delinquent and start a dance club, we can insist on listening to sad FM during a boat ride, or do drugs out in public, or graffiti up a wall, we can tell Kim how cool we think he is. Like I said, Revishal is a veritable playground of self-expression, but Let's go back to something that I said in the beginning. After those rare moments when you truly bare your soul and say exactly what's on your mind to another person, do you feel unsatisfied? Like you should have said something differently or like they must have completely missed the point? See, we could call all of these things self-expression, but really it tends to feel like nothing but self-transcription. We aren't really being ourself when we do all these things. We're just displaying an approximation of ourself. An approximation whose accuracy is limited by the variety of intrusive thoughts we're presented with and the dice rolls of our skill checks. We sure as hell didn't intend to say, I want to have fuck with you to the attractive woman outside of our motel room, but through the ever-filtering web of mental and physical muscle spasms that we grind our personality through every time we interface with this world, that's what came out. We didn't necessarily want to tell Kim that we're just a loser, we're simply clicking whichever intrusive thoughts seem the most appealing at the time. And the gravity and specificity of our messages were lost to a hundred such impulses. 
Eventually, after a whole game spent approximating our personality through the lens of impulsive half-representations, we're left with nothing but the heartbreaking, soul-crushing, spirit-annihilating revelation that all communication and every other means of interfacing with this world that we have is nothing but that. An approximation of what we really want to say, what we really felt, who we really were. It's around this point in the game that you might start having something like a midlife crisis. You start switching up the things that you say, you start subtly altering the goals that you placed for yourself. Instead of being a boring, run-of-the-mill liberal, you might try to be a full-blown eater of the rich. Maybe you started doing drugs after staying totally sober for those first three days, or maybe you completely switch it up and decide that enough is enough. If you want people to notice you, you just have to solve this case harder than anyone has ever solved a case before. Honestly, who knows where your head's at? Who cares? You spent so long trying to make people understand you, and the closest you've gotten is Kim, this man who simply refuses to acknowledge all of the interesting, thought-provoking, and darkly poetic things that you've been doing around him for the past three days. There really is no coming back from this one. <clears throat> Eventually, though, either through blind luck, divine intervention, sheer attrition, or out of Colossia's pity for you, you end up solving the case of the hanged man. As it turns out, he wasn't hanged at all. He was shot in the head, and then the Hardy Boys hung his body up to stage a lynching and get their friend Klausia off the suspect list. The hanged man, Lely, was an awful man. A pillager and a rapist, working for a mercenary company doing anything from destroying villages to, in this case, busting a union, so long as his company was paid. Any number of people would have wanted him dead. A battle even broke out in the streets between the other mercenaries with Lely's company, and the locals who were presumed guilty of his hanging. However, in the end, it turns out to have been nothing but a pot shot from a random, burned out, and exhausted man like yourself. While you were clinging on to the long dead dream of disco, he was clinging on to the long dead dream of a true communist society. Josef Lilianovich Dros sees himself as the last card-carrying communist. After the revolution failed and the tribunals of communist soldiers began, Dros managed to flee to a network of small islands off the northwest corner of Revishal. In the aftermath of the failed revolution, as society slowly started to return to Revishal, Dros had little to do but simply watch through the scope of his rifle as people slowly forgot about his dream of revolution and accepted their circumstances for what they were. Slowly but surely, he went mad, until one day he decided to finally pull the trigger and put a bullet in the head of Lely while he was f***ing Klausia. The Hardy Boys disguised the murder as a lynching so that Klausia wouldn't be taken into custody, and that's where you came in. This seems... pretty random. A whole list of suspects, but ultimately, Lely was killed for practically no reason by a stranger who didn't even know him. Somebody who was completely invisible to the world. However, that invisibility is what connects Dros to the rest of the story in the most concrete way possible. In that opening monologue, I was talking about Harry's situation, and my own experiences with isolation and self-expression. If you'd indulge me to be a bit gratuitous for a moment, I'd like to read a part of that opening monologue a second time. This time, instead of thinking about yourself, or Harry, or me, I want you to think about Dros. After seeing his revolution, his dream of a perfect world fail, he wound up completely isolated on an island, only ever allowing himself to move around at night, spending all day watching people through his scope, knowing full well that they would never know he existed, and that they would never understand his message. Nobody would ever understand communism the same way that he did again. As far as the world is concerned, maybe there is no real you. Maybe you are just your job, your grades, your politics. Nobody understands the connection between all those different genres of music you listen to. Nobody else sees a pickup truck as the same dazzling array of complicated symbolism and iconography that you do. You've tried explaining it to them, and they've not. You've tried explaining it to them, and they nodded their heads, but they'll never see it how you do. 
Maybe you don't exist at all. Not the real you, anyways. That person will never truly be a part of anyone else's lives. Your true self is just a random sequence of ideas and opinions popping in and out of a single, meaningless perspective on life. No single one significant enough to ever impact anything around you. Your true self is nothing but a sequence of random numbers, functionally identical to the 8,067,572,291 other sequences of random numbers that inhabit the minds of the human race. Nobody will ever care about your number sequence. Harry and Dross were both holding on to a dream that society had already forgotten about. Harry was holding on to the dream of a freer world where he could party and connect with people who would really care. Dross was holding on to the dream of a world without class, a world where all people were truly equal and where the many didn't have to bend the knee to the few. Disco or communism, they're both dead. They were both beautiful ideas that were doomed to fail from their very inception. Sure, they weren't exactly the same vision of a utopian world, but to Harry and to Dross, they were everything. Their whole lifestyle, their whole identity, and they're both completely lost to time. The backlash of these deaths led to both of them being totally isolated from society. Harry was stuck inside his own head for so long, unable to truly connect with anybody else, and so was Dross. Both of them were completely surrounded by people, but both of them had completely given up on ever talking and, I mean, truly communicating with anybody else ever again. Hell, in both instances, where the two of them decided to bang their fists against the world one last time and leave some sort of a mark, they both left a broken window in their wake. Their stories are the same, however different their dreams may be. This is something that I relate to a lot. Years before Disco Elysium ever came out, I named this channel Leadhead because I was so fixated on this idea that all I was doing was desperately trying to express myself to an audience who would never truly understand what I'd been trying to say. Like Harry or Dross, I felt like my true self was totally stuck inside my own head, unable to ever pass through. Hence, Leadhead. It hasn't always been that way either. Back when I was 16, I felt totally at ease communicating with the world however I wanted and having them really listen, loving freely, speaking freely, acting freely. Then somewhere around age 20, I sobered up and wound up feeling totally cut off from the whole world. A party that was never supposed to end suddenly ended and I was all alone with far too many inhibitions to break out of my head again. Eventually that led me to starting this channel and once that picked up and became my job, that party died too, in a way. I moved out for the first time, lost a couple friends, and started questioning some pretty fundamental things about myself. And another endless party suddenly fell apart. Another year of isolation. Another year of feeling like nobody would ever understand me or even care to. Whether it's relationship problems, sobriety, responsibilities, or most prominently self-hatred, a lot of the time, life just feels like it's just a never-ending cycle of pure and worryless expression, followed by a total, endless, self-inflicted isolation. A million disco eras, each one inevitably dying out as the world moves on from the things that we built together. I'm even going through one of those isolation chapters in my life right now. This time it's one of the self-hatred ones. I'll leave it at that for now but lately I've been right there next to Harry Dubois and Josef Lilianovich Dros, reminiscing on how I used to pound my fists against the walls of my mind and lamenting how I've recently resigned to just sitting down on my island, all alone and waiting to die. I kept talking about how Harry and Dros have been going through the exact same thing. Well, there's one other character who's in very similar circumstances that I've held off on mentioning until now. This is where that second objective, finding someone who cares, gets its resolution. The Insulindian Phasmid. See, there's another side to this whole wanting to know who you are thing. Another route that a lot of us strive for when it comes to self-discovery is simply trying to be normal. You're a freak, and you know that much. But if you could just be normal, 
you might have an easier time answering that tired old question of who am I. After all, you, the genius that you are, have a pretty good understanding of what makes all those other people tick. You're the special one. You're the one that nobody understands. If you could just be more like them, maybe you'd understand yourself too. Back to the topic at hand. The Insulindian Phasmid is a cryptid. That is to say it's a creature that mainstream science doesn't believe exists, but whose existence is testified by dozens of creeps looking for attention, like Bigfoot. It's allegedly a tall, reed-like stick bug who hides in the reeds all day, making itself completely invisible to the world. It's understood to be incredibly cautious when feeding or moving. Patient, stealthy, and well-disguised, it's no wonder that all attempts to prove the existence of the Insulindian Phasmid have utterly failed. Well, by some miracle, right as you're about to put the cuffs on Dros, the Insulindian Phasmid appears out of the reeds to greet Harry, Kim, and their new detainee. At this moment, Harry and the Phasmid have a conversation, or at least Harry imagines a conversation with the Phasmid. See, the Insulindian Phasmid is a lot like Harry and Dros in a lot of ways. It too is secluded itself, rarely interacting with any other creatures. Like Harry, nobody understands the Phasmid's true nature. However, unlike Harry, there isn't any dissonance in that fact in the creature's mind. Harry and Dros had to make their presence known. It would simply be against human nature for them to stay secluded their entire lives. Harry had to come out of that motel room and discover who he was. Dros had to fire that rifle and leave a mark on his world. This creature, and its grim reality of dim perceptions of nothing but leaves and sand and the occasional vibration, serves as our first affirmation that what we've been doing over the course of this game, putting ourselves out there, has been worth it. The creature says that it doesn't envy us whatsoever. It says that to be cursed with such sentience, such burning desire, would be a horror beyond all understanding. There is a strange wisdom to this perspective of the world. The Phasmid remarks that by day, it hides in the reeds and tries to go unnoticed, but at night, it plays with the buoys and eats delicious leaves. This is, in a sense, exactly what we've been doing over the course of this game. We've managed through all of our trial and error to find a balance. We can pretend to be a normal cop and do normal productive things, working on the case, interviewing suspects, going over notes and clues, but we're also able to be more expressive, more true to ourselves when we get the opportunity to. Cop by day, philosopher by night, that's what we are. Just like the Phasmid. Sometimes we're an inanimate reed, indistinguishable from thousands of others, not worthy of any attention. But other times we're a fun-loving, sensitive creature, kicking around buoys and making splashes in the water. This sort of balance is exactly what it takes to be a complete person. It's why Kim has a cigarette in the evenings when he goes over his notes and doesn't smoke like a fumigator any other time he gets the chance. A balance like that is incredibly difficult to come by. Like I said earlier, all that any of us want is to be understood wholly, but that simply is impossible. So many of us want to try to alleviate that pain by trying to dedicate our entire lives to our message, our representation of self. When you don't pay your taxes, you rationalize it as some sort of statement against the man. When you get stressed out and have to cancel plans, a part of you hopes that the other party is worried about you, thinking about you. Ultimately, the balance between those two sides? Well, I'd go so far as to say that it's the key to happiness, knowing when to be a reed and knowing when to play. You may very well be stuck inside of your own head on your own little island for all of eternity. Maybe there really is no way out of the lead head. But that doesn't mean that you should ever stop trying. Seeing the Insul Indian Phasmid as beautiful and inconsequential as it is, serves as a stark reminder of what you're reduced to when you truly do give up on escaping. Harry may, at the start of the game, wish that he could be as simple and unaware as the Phasmid. But by the end, it's my opinion that he learns that his current reality, one of half-representations of an ever-ill-defined true self, is much better than the alternative, a lifetime of non-existence intruded only on by white noise and bare-bones mechanical stimulation. <clears throat> At the end of Disco Elysium, Harry learns that it's 
Better to live in the ruins of Disco than to suffocate under the weight of the debris. The same goes for your Disco, your good old days, your failed relationships, your previous senses of self. Don't try to dig up the past, that's what Dross did. Instead, take all of that grief and build something new on top of it. Don't be Tequila Sunset, let yourself see another Tequila Sunrise. <laughs> let the world back in. Fuck the old party, start a new party, with different implications, different motivations, and maybe even a different ending. <sighs> Do you feel alone? Do you, whether you're talking with somebody, hugging them, kissing them, fucking them, or even looking directly into their eyes, feel like you're still alone? Have you spent your life trying to push the limits of how close you can bring another person to you, only to find that no matter how intimate the two of you are, you're still just alone? After those rare moments, when you truly bare your soul and say exactly what's on your mind to another person, do you feel unsatisfied? Like you should have said something different, or like they must have completely missed the point? Maybe you've tried butting your way into pre-existing groups of friends, or even having your own groups form around you, only to end up feeling even more alone. Do these other people feel the same way about you? Are your relationships just their most recent iterations of a long, exhausted concept of true oneness with someone else? Maybe you are alone. You spend so much time thinking about how none of these people will ever know the real you. You put so much thought and effort into demonstrating to all of them who the real you is, but once the performance is done, you just go right back to dwelling on whether or not they understood your message. As far as the world is concerned, maybe there is no real you. Maybe you are just your job, your grades, your politics. Nobody understands the connection between all those different genres of music you listen to. Nobody else sees a pickup truck as the same dazzling array of complicated symbolism and iconography that you do. You've tried explaining it to them, but they'll never see it how you do. But then, why does that even matter in the first place? If another person saw the world exactly how you did, that wouldn't make your perception any more true. It wouldn't make it any more valid. Rather than obsessing over some imaginary place in time where everything was allegedly perfect and everyone was on the same page as you, build something new. Don't live alone on your own island, blocking out everyone else's ideas for the sake of trying to propagate your own. Take the world inside of you. You might still be on a little island. Nobody else will ever know what it's like to live on your island, to be stranded there. But as it turns out, that doesn't mean that your island can't have visitors. So, go open a dialogue with somebody. Put yourself out there, express yourself. Say something that's on your mind, and rather than obsessing over whether or not it was your true self-speaking, just enjoy the music. Be it disco or shoegaze, grunge or new metal, the two of you can dance the night away in an imperfect but nevertheless euphoric harmony on a little piece of your island that, if only for a moment, you got to share with another. You know, going into this video, I already knew ahead of time that there would be a few comments saying, geez, you need to clean your room, because they don't understand that that was, like, part of the bit, that was part of the set, moved a couch out here, got a bunch of beer cans and shit, all for the sake of the video. Um, so I was really hoping to show you guys a clean room in the background when I filmed this Patreon bit, but, um, I'm going to be moving out. We have got to, uh, get out of this apartment, so...
long story short, the relevant part for you all is I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to make my videos yet. Uh, we're going to be between apartments for a little bit, so maybe I'll just end up filming in a storage unit. I'm really sorry in advance if um, the next couple videos I put out sound shitty or look shitty or if there's some sort of other unforeseen issue with them that I'm not aware of yet. But um, hopefully at least you guys can see the... Uh, difference now that I'm doing this new work schedule. I feel like I'm churning out really high quality stuff way faster than I was ever able to before. I'm super proud of this video. But uh, with all that said, the real reason that I'm here is to go ahead and verbally thank the patrons, especially those who donate $10 or more monthly, such as Christopher ASS, Babylon Broken, The Narcissist Cookbook, Asiobatoon, Spooky Ina, Guybrush, M. Cloy, Cappy, Lake, Mina, Eva Knight, Panda, Mr. Kokogo, Shea Theus, Nomad Delilah Jester, Bjorb, Lily Leones, Neris, Sean Hamilton, Monkey Monks Monkey Monastery, Voiced Mute, Haunted Mystic, Charlotte, Freedom Rider, Rio, Laura M, Poof Donut, Femboy Fishing, Atheist, Joannis, IW, Arda Aurelia, Vega Nelson, Demise, Mia Maple, Nicole, Ada Avery, George Rosenbaum, Neurofilter, The Coombe Slayer, Summer Celine Garnet Midnight, Big Time Jim, Darius Fazier, Dennis Valshakamer, Almost Dead Again, Gab, David Kaiser, Erica, and CeeLo. Uh, I guess I don't really have much else to say. I would like to promise that the next video is coming quickly, but I've got to be out of this apartment in the next uh, eight days, and I really don't know what's going to happen. Um... I'll try to stick to it. Next video is probably going to be on Dishonored or maybe Thief 2. Um, I'll keep you guys posted on my Twitter and Discord and all that stuff. Uh, thanks a bunch. Mwah.